Um, thanks for having us. Uh, we are uh, we are with the NASA Center for Climate Simulation, based out of uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, I'm Jonathan Mills, and this is Bob Budden. Uh, though we actually both work remote. Um, but uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, our open stack cloud and a little bit about the science that that we uh, run on it, and then sort of how how we run that cloud. Uh, this was the idea to do this came from the open stack scientific sig special interest group. Uh, the scientific sig is uh, people like us who run open stack to support science. Uh, and so we got some science stuff from the real scientists, but full disclaimer, uh, we're just as admits. So don't try to ask us questions about the science, please. <laughs> right. So um, one of our premier customers that's getting a lot of attention lately is the, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Um, its purpose is to explore dark energy and dark matter. Uh, and search for uh, search for and image exoplanets uh, and many topics in infrared astrophysics. Uh, its primary instrument is the Wide Field Instrument, or WFI. Uh, it'll use 18 infrared detectors for a panoramic field that's 100 times wider than the Hubble Space Telescope's infrared instrument. Um, uh, this is supposed to launch in 2027. Uh, so you guys are probably familiar with James Webb, uh, whereas James Webb, you know, can can do this Hubble view, but like at way deeper resolution. This is going to complement James Webb by being a broad, broader field, right? So uh, this instrument and James Webb together will give you a a the ability to see a wide view, but also zoom in deep on it. So, um, we support this team in, in many different ways. Um, we have our, our neutron networks have provider networks that go back to shared POSIX file systems. Uh, where these guys access petabytes of data. Um, we get them access to GPUs. We have, uh, you know, the, the flexibility of the cloud environment. Um, you know, we can build VMs in different ways to meet whatever their interests are. Um, some of the, uh, their VMs we put into Slurm for scheduling. Others we hand to individual scientists for you know, interactive testing and so on. Um, we they use uh, Jupyter Hub, um, which you know we we have cloud host that pretty easily. Um, uh, we host databases for them, and um, um, oh, um, fast data transfer nodes, so that they can do they have a dedicated transfer node that doesn't get stopped on by other, other people. And we manage all those VMs for them. So we take care of the patching and the security aspects so the right. scientist doesn't have to do with that. Yeah. Get yeah. all of their work and we can provide that. It's basically platform as a service, right? We have, our team has other sysadmins who help run those uh, platform as a service VMs. So another one of our big customers, and, and again, we do mostly climate science. Uh, and this is the ICE Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite, ICESAT-2. Uh, its purpose is to produce a highly detailed uh, measurement of the height of Earth's ice, water, and land surfaces uh, to enable investigation of changes over time particularly for Arctic and Antarctic ice. Uh, its primary instrument is the Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System, or ATLAS, uh, which, which is a LIDAR, basically. It fires 10,000 times a second, 
and precisely measures the time for individual photons to bounce off the surface and return to the satellite. Um, I think I read that correctly. <laughs> uh, so uh, what we do for these guys is much the same uh, as what we do for Roman ST. Uh, we, you know, we are an HPC center and we have a huge supercomputer. But for those of you who work with big supercomputers, you know that it's typically a really locked down and inflexible environment, right? It's good for one kind of thing, which is huge MPI jobs. But science, you know, the way that scientists are, are doing their work now, it's, it's so much more diverse than just MPI jobs. And so uh, we get ISAT access to uh, Jupyter Hub, we get the fast access to huge data repositories, uh, both uh, <laughs> our, our NASIS, they can file system is fast to write to. We also have a huge uh, archive of data that's NFS hosted. That's very fast for read. Um, so they, this allows them to do lots of analytics type work, read from one, write to the other and so forth. Um, Slurm, data transfer nodes, Jupyter Hub, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, this is this is the, the stuff that we're being asked for. Um, and you know, the nice thing is the flexibility of the cloud. You know, we can easily reconfigure it to give them any, you know anything else within reason that they need uh, instead of the, the static environment of a supercomputer. Um, are these the guys also using GPUs or is that wrong? We have a small number of GPUs in the cloud. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. So we're going to give you an overview of our cloud's architecture. You want to take over? Yeah. Um, so a little bit about the base deployment. So we, uh, as a lot of the other large OpenStack deployments kind of just totally rolled our own. Um, we're not using anything like Triple O or Cola or OpenStack Ansible. Uh, we, we built this from the ground up. Um, but at the time, there were needs that we had that weren't supported by the, the standard package deployments. Um, so right now we're on OpenStack Wallaby um, and we're using the RPMs from the RDO project from Red Hat, which is nice. Uh, we have XCAD as our tool for deploying what we call the undercloud, the bare metal, and then some of the VMs that are hosting the OpenStack control plane. And then we use Ansible to interface and push out the OpenStack deployment, the networking configs, um, the switches, the, uh, the NetApp filers are all mostly controlled by Ansible. And right now we're just kind of focusing on the core uh, microservices of OpenStack. And these are largely what we need for our mission and what we've had time um, to get up and running. There's obviously other other parts of OpenStack that could be used. We just need the time to play with them uh, yeah. and see if there's something that fit our customers' needs, you know, the, the scientists' needs. For the most part, we haven't been asked for anything other than these core services. Yeah, so we've got, we listed the core services in case there are people that are not super familiar with OpenStack, but we've got you know, Keystone, your authorization service. We've got Glance to manage all of the virtual machine images, uh, Neutron for all the SDN and, and provider networks, Nova for your typical compute, and Horizon, the web GUI for um, some of the IS tenants that are gonna get directly involved and deploy the VMs themselves. Um, all of these microservices are triplicated, so we can patch OpenStack pretty much seamlessly um, and also tolerate failures or downtimes or when we get the upgrades, we'll be able to do that in a role. Um, of these replicated services, they also span multiple buildings. That way, if we have some kind of a network event or some other catastrophic failure, we can maintain um, the OpenStack core still being up and, and mitigate the or isolate the failure domain to a certain building of the three that we use. Um, one thing that was important to us that wasn't available a long time ago when the, the, the map deployments rather like Triple O and Kala was we had to do as a, a federal requirement, everything has to be SSL encrypted. So all of our microservices are encrypted end to end. All of our RabbitMQ buses are encrypted end to end. There isn't anything that's not encrypted, even on internal private networks that aren't exposed. 
Mm -hmm. the, the use of XCAT uh, very much comes out of the fact that we're our legacy is our computer. Uh, it was our center. It was it, it was our apartment that made available the original Bay of cluster. Um, we've been using XCAT since 2006, I think. And so when we approached uh, OpenStack from the standpoint of DIY, it, 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 it was tools we were familiar with. What well, makes sense to us? Well, we just ran with XCAT because it, it made sense. And then used our own CM to layer on the other pieces. Um, so here's a high level resource overview. Um, our cloud is about 300 hypervisors. We have 8,500 cores, about 75 terabytes of RAM. Um, we have three availability zones that are um, a one to one ratio to each building that our cloud resides in. Um, each availability zone also has co located storage. That way, all the VMs storage is native to that building. They're not susceptible to latency problems, which Having to reach out to a different a different net of file in a different building. Um, we run two MariaDB clusters um, to house all the database access. Um, so we have one that runs all of the control plane, and that's shared with the two AZs building A and B that have smaller number of computes. And then building C has the predominant majority of our compute. So we set up a, um, a separate Galera cluster for that just to keep things isolated a little bit. Um, each of the of the two major zones has a different fiber drop for um, the NASA network, which is in OpenStack terms the the floating IP network or the external network. So we can tolerate um, for HA purposes. We share the same IP space, but they're tied to different buildings. You could lose a building and still have failover to the other building that would have access to the same floating range. Um, so that allows us to HA services as we need to. Um, so we, we modeled our, our compute flavors after AWS, uh, for better or worse. Um, this is just a, a picture of what our flavors look like in OpenStack. It's not intuitive. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll get to some of the uh, <laughs> the caveats of this later. But yeah. uh, we, we do have a heterogeneous compute environment. We have both Intel and AMD. Uh, we have some GPUs, some V100s in one of the AZs for people to do experimenting. Um, on that instead of camping on an interactive slurm uh, node on our GPU cluster. Yeah. But the flavors are very much uh, you know, fractional increments of specific pieces of hardware so that when it's all scheduled out, there's no orphaned resources, right? It it it, it adds up. It's like Tetris, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, so they, they largely coincide with a full node, a half node, a quarter node, yeah. and then some minor fraction of that for, for little tiny one-offs. All right, so um, our networking uh, leaf spine topology in a full cloth fabric. This is in every AZ is built like this. Um, we mostly uh, Mellanox 100 gig networking, uh, the Spectrum 1 ASIC, if you're familiar with that stuff. Uh, we run Cumulus Linux on it, which has been interesting. Um, Bob wrote Ansible code to configure the, the Cumulus stuff for us. Um, it's all MLAG, LACP. It's MLAG between the switches. It's LACP down to the nodes. And so every hypervisor has a bottom zero. It's either dual tens or dual 25s. Uh, so re reasonably fast. Um, so we heavily segment all of our control plane traffic into different VLANs, uh, different VLANs for control plane, storage, uh, on tap traffic to the net of filers, IPMI, Pixie traffic, it's all. E even our even our out of band switch access is in a separate VLAN, so that's all broken out. Uh, our tenants uh, use VLAN segmentation IDs. Uh, we support VXLAN, but we, nobody's using it, and um, frankly, we don't really know anybody at NASA who uses VXLAN, and we don't even know if the security folks would like it. So that's a that's another thing we're going to have to deal with. Um, so we do have very high speed interconnect between our availability zones. You see four by hundred G, four by forty G, 
Uh, our Neutron ML2 plugin is still Linux Bridge, but that's going to have to change for the, those of you in the know. Um, we like it because it's easy to use. It's really easy to uh, debug it, DCP dump it, and uh, there's nothing obfuscated about Linux bridges. Uh, but uh, yeah, so our L3 agents are, you know, the Neutron network nodes. We run the in DVR SNAT mode. So it's, you know, DVR HA routers. Uh, our compute nodes are DVR no external. So we don't waste floating IPs that, not, we don't waste external IPs, network IPs on the compute nodes. And it's less of a security potential issue. Um, so this is the topology of um, our cloud. So the top uh, left corner would represent the core data center of the NASA Center for Climate Simulation. Um, and then our, uh, how our other uh, availability zones relate to that. And you see in the middle is basically what, what we think of as our external network. It's the broader NASA networks and how we connect to it from different places. So infrastructure as a service, VMs, would get a floating IP directly on that NASA network. Uh, but internally, of course, they'll have their own dedicated VLAN and their own different IP space. Um, you see in between our AZs, is this very fast, um, we call it the cross connect. It's about a kilometer ish, right? Of uh, very fast uh, uh, 400 gig of bandwidth uh, between those AGs. And that mostly carries platform as a service uh, traffic and, uh, you know, our, our high speed storage going all the way out there to the VMs. Yes. Yeah, sure. So, um, our storage is all uh, NetApp filers. Uh, we have two AFFs that are all flash, um, and those are in redundant pairs at every site. And we have one that's a hybrid uh, in one of the ACs. We have about 140 terabytes total of storage. Um, we're really happy with our NetApps because they GDP to compress at unbelievable levels yeah. uh, for VMs. We've seen upwards of 20 to 1, uh, which is remarkable. And, yeah. and to think how much storage we would have to pay for if we weren't GDP at that level and we're using something like GPFS, um, our cost for storage should be yeah. uh, way higher than it is. You can imagine how well uh, a Linux base OS dedupes, right? You could, like just make forever copies of it. So we also hold, we hold mirrors of all our repos on the net apps. Right. It helps them be able to do everything better. Yep. And we, that also allows us to keep our own internal mirrors for everything. Um, the other cool thing with the apps is the snap mirror uh, ability. We can set snap mirrors for important data between all the buildings so we can at our net app level, we can provide redundancy for things that we know are, are incredibly critical. Um, that's kind of a disaster for happening. We use Pretty standard data uh, NFS for clients and Nova's backends. Um, so each of those have their own flex call. Uh, Cinder has a couple different flex calls and uses the special on tap driver to do some copy on write offloads and other tricks that you can do mm -hmm. to make things faster. That is NFS version. Or we use 4.2, four two, I think. On I think we're going 4.2. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we get the sparse support, I think, in 4.2. Yeah. Um, so each then also we have uh, each AD has its own cinder volume type. So this allows us to, um, through OpenStack commands, migrate a VM's data from one building to another. So uh, all of our VMs are backed by cinder volumes. So what we can do is if you need to move a VM, you tear down the VM, we issue a cinder retype. Cinder tells the one that has to transfer to the other. It'll take that copy and then we can bring it up in the other AZ. So this allows us to fail over all kinds of things as well. Is handy and, and move VMs back and forth across the building. So, yeah. we, we do have this in enhanced uh, instance creation thing, which is a feature of the on tap driver for Cinder. Or basically, if you have your glance uh, storage on the same filer as your Cinder storage and you're spawning 
uh, a new cinder volume from an image, it's basically like a, it's a pointer, right? It's like a, almost like an instantaneous zero copy kind of operation. So you can boot VMs really, really fast like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, all of this stuff is also handled by Antimal. So we have, you know, Antimal controlling access to the net apps, uh, doing all the RBACs that are necessary for Cinder to have the right global scope permissions, but not have too much access to other pieces of the filings that could be a security problem. Um, yeah. And then it also controls this flex ball creation, the SVM creation, the lifts. Uh, yeah. Most of the, the stored requirements. All the RBACs that are needed for this. Yeah, all the RBACs are for Cinder and Nova. Yeah. We got eight minutes. We got to set. We got to okay. uh, GPUs. I mean, we don't. We have a bare metal GPU cluster with eighty-eight V one hundreds, and that is deployed from XCAT. But all the ancillary services in that are are cloud hosted. So uh, all of the uh, uh, login nodes, the Slurm Kettle D, Slurm DVD, Maria DB, all the that's actually Puppet managed CM for those because it aligns more with most of our past systems are puppet managed. That's a legacy thing. Um, so yeah, the 100s we do have a DGX A100. That's been fun. <laughs> um, we we actually have some GPU nodes in the cloud that you can schedule through Nova. Uh, you know about extra extra specs, but that's not they're not VG, it's PCI pass through. Uh, and you know, the reasons we avoided GPU V GPUs down here, it, it was a performance penalty unless you did lots of sort lots of clever stuff with CPU pinning. Um, there were license and, and license costs associated with those drivers that we didn't have a budget to pay for. Um, uh, the vGPU drivers are essentially deprecated, as I understand it now, or NVIDIA is moving to some new thing. Uh, and, you know, for our users, our power users would rather have the full GPU anyway, rather than the same GPU. Right. So we, have, we have two nodes with 12 GPUs, and then we end up yeah. carving up as, as one or two GPUs yeah. that can be requested. It's mostly for testing and able to camp on those nodes before they have their jobs ready to move to PRISM. Yeah. And, we are we are going to get some more of those GPU nodes. There's also talk of some uh, Grace Hopper, uh, Grace Grace type nodes that could be coming our way soon. All right. Discussion. So uh, we want to talk about a few of the things that we've done well, and then uh, you know go over our challenges and what's next. So um, the good stuff. Uh, it's been really awesome having OpenStack seamlessly integrate with um, with our provider networks. You know, all of our data center VLANs that access all of the resources that our users would need to access anyway. Um, so uh, we've at, we've done GPFS, Panassas, NFS. We have something like ninety petabytes of storage in all. And a cloud would be useless if, if you couldn't access that stuff very, very quickly, or easily, or securely. Um, but you know, because of the of the root problems with uh, shared file systems, you can only access those kinds of file systems from a platform as a service. Yeah, we don't give people root on those. Uh, we give people root on infrastructure as a service, but then you can't melt meld to parallel bus because it can't be root or par parallel bus. Um, we have open ID integration with uh, NASA's uh, IDP. Uh, and so that has been, that was hard to set up, but now that it's there, it's hugely convenient. Uh, it means that People can get access to our cloud through all the normal NASA um, identity kind of tools that that do the authorization in a way that makes sense to NASA security. Um, so that was a big confidence boost for getting people into our cloud. The NetApp integration, a huge win. The dedupe is mind-blowingly cool. 
compared to say SEP, which you know can triplicate and and blow up your data, we're going the other way, right? Um, now the downside of it is that we get people in infrastructure as a service who want to store lots of data, and right now we don't have really a way to accommodate that. Um, RBACs, you want to talk about the RBACs? Yeah, sure. So. Prior to Explore, we have two separate OpenStack clouds, one for handling the past tenants and one for handling the IS tenants, um, largely for security reasons, you know, to lock down to keep past users out of downloading the, the images or being able to run certain uh, things that they should be. So what we ended up doing with Explore is we, we merged these two clouds together and we set up complicated, some complicated OpenStack RBACs to, to give the IS tenants where they need to be and then the past tenants are in a much more locked down environment. It allowed us to, to yeah, yeah, put this together. Um, we've had some major challenges. Oh, um, I want to touch on the forced OS upgrades. So, um, as we mentioned, we use the packages from RDO. And when RDO says, well, we're not going to use RHEL 8 anymore, never mind that RHEL 8 is supported for like seven more years. Well, we have to go where RDO, RDO goes. So, we we have to ditch rel 8 i guess we have to do uh rel 9 now right so that's a big these kinds of changes and so you know just in the last three and a half years it, we went from CentOS 7 to CentOS 8 to CentOS 8 extreme and and then because of bugs in CentOS 8 stream we switched to rocky 8 which was more stable and but now we have to go to 9 right so that is a lot of major OS changes in just three and a half years. Um, a, a really unsustainable amount of change. It's got to settle down, right? Um, yeah, we had big bugs in in with DVR in stream and so on. Uh, RabbitMQ has been, and I know we're about out of time. RabbitMQ. The, the classic mirror queues, right? Everybody knows that was kind of a big problem. It was a big problem for us, especially when we ran Sealometer, because uh, that put a lot of stress on the bus. Um, uh, you had to whip up a script that would just like, what, catch it, it and- It would count the number of computes that were down if it was above yeah, the threshold, it would, it would help our AMQP bus, so and then it would help the Nova conductor, yeah. and then, you know, in a kind of an order that, that allowed it to recover properly. Right, so that we weren't up in the middle of the night. Uh, we finally gave up and just went to single instance uh, rabbits, and it's actually- been, And then we just monitor- Monitor crazy. about it, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Other challenges, uh, telemetry is a nightmare. Um, uh, Nochi abandoned or deprecated. Um, Manasco was actually great. I loved Manasco, but uh, it's it's leaderless and it's complex. Uh, it doesn't work with CloudKitty. Um, and, you know, Sealometer, what do you, what do you even say about Sealometer? Like, I, yeah, don't forget it. Uh, you're trying DVR routers, you know, if you're not doing OVN, uh, well, the, the routers pull all the information serially off the rabbit in, in Q bus. So if you've just restarted everything, if you have dozens and dozens of routers, it takes a long time for that to stabilize. It would see about 20 minutes time for an, an L3 router to fully recover all of its tenants. Yeah, um, and so we definitely run into a few snags with that. Glance, I mean, how, how do you deploy Glance correctly anymore? I mean, uh, are you supposed to use the Python eventlet, which doesn't really support the SSL very well, or do you use Mod, Mod Whiskey or U Whiskey or, or, or G Unicorn, Green Unicorn, or, or whatever? Uh, I don't know. So, somebody needs to figure out how to deploy plans correctly. Um, uh, DB disconnects. <laughs> right yeah. now, logs are still, but we see this a lot. It seems to not cause problems, but it's a it's a byproduct of HA proxy timeouts before you know MariaDB client timeouts. Yeah. Um, we try to tweak that away, and when we did, we would see our recovery time from an HA proxy failover become minutes instead of you know milliseconds or so. Yep. So we're looking for some clarity sometime on that, on how to yep. you know, clean up our logs. Okay, so um, 
Another big thing we went into is the user education about what combinations of things will work in terms of the flavors, the availability zones, which storage device, that sort of thing. And a big problem for us is that Horizon is perfectly happy to let you boot an impossible combination. Like it doesn't do any sort of validation. Like, like I can try to boot a compute node here with storage that's in a different AZ with a flavor that doesn't even like match the node and it just blows up and then we get a ticket that it failed, right? And so I'm like, well, you can't boot an impossible combination. Yeah, it's your classic OpenStack no valid host, which it, yeah. it always points and looks like an operator problem. Right. Like, oh. The flavors aren't named intuitively because uh, people that we work for wanted it to look like AWS flavors, but um, you know, it's to our end users trying to read it, and we only have one more slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the reader trying to use it, if the, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And I wish we had just named our flavors something that is like mnemonic or like you know it inherently tells the user what it is. <laughs> Great. Uh, and then so moving forward, uh, I think this is our last one. Yes. Uh, so we need to upgrade OpenStack. Um, we need to get to Zed or Antelope or. By the time we get to Antelope, they'll probably be on C. Uh, who knows? Um, EL support ends with Yoga, so again, we have to go to e you know Red Hat Nine, Rocky Nine, or or something, um, or Ubuntu because frankly we're frustrated with the state of the whole RHEL landscape and all those gyrations. Um, so. The neutron driver change, I mean, it's going to be hard for us to go uh, Linux bridge to OBS. I mean, we have some of the B switch uh, experience. We've actually run it in the past. We ran it before we switched to Linux bridge, funny enough. Um, but now, bam, here's OBN. So now we have to go and learn OBN, right? So that's, it, I mean, it sounds like it's great, but it's also complicated, right? It's a whole new ball of wax to learn. Uh, we want to implement the RabbitMQ uh, quorum queues, right? That's something else we don't know. Um, maybe load balancer as a service. Uh, Bob wants to do sender active active. Yeah, the sender volume active active. That's yeah. Still. I would really love to build some better SDN as our cloud grows. Um, switch from cumulus switches to Sonic, maybe do more VX lands, maybe do BGP unnumbered. Uh, maybe a centralized SDN controller so that we're not logging into individual switches to, to change ports and so, so forth. That would be cool. And last but not least, I want to replace XCAT with Ironic. We don't know the best way to run Ironic yet for our use case, so that's something that we're thinking about. We're going to be testing that in our test and development system. Um, and then, you know, if we do Ironic, you know, what else do we do with it? Do we let the users use Ironic or do we just keep it to ourselves as the cloud admins? Do we use it to deploy HPC systems, right? So there's like a whole new set of possibilities we need to consider with that. Okay. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Q and A, but uh, we've overrun <laughs> our time by five minutes, um, but we'll be around. Later, if you want to get with us and ask us some questions about this, uh, and um, I'm happy to share these slides. This is all public. I know we started a little bit late, so maybe we can take questions until you know, like for the next four minutes. Uh, I know there's going to be some questions. So that I, I can see people are eager to. Yeah, I think Vincent came online. Online. Vincent, do you, do you have a question? Yeah, that was super interesting. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, I full disclosure, I'm an uh, I'm an open stack consultant working for Red Hat. I work with telcos. Uh, some of them have thousands or dozens of thousands of nodes. Uh, it, it, your challenges are uh, very. Uh, 
very interesting and I, I, I can see where you're coming from. But I have some friends uh, who in companies work with RDO and CentOS and it's been super disruptive uh, with them. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to mention is uh, you don't have to do Ironic uh, to deploy. You can choose any deployer uh, you you want and then use pre-deployed node, nodes with OpenStack. And this is actually the way things are going uh, with 17. Uh, for for the um, uh, Glance and uh, Cinder uh, stuff on NetApp filers, we uh, at one of the telcos uh, I was with, we ran into an issue that it uh, they kept asking us to to use this unsigned, unpackaged uh, binary uh, that was supposedly making those clone operations on the NetApp box faster. But it turned out that if you have big filers, then the cache doesn't uh, replicate from head to head so it could only work uh, one time out of eight so you might want to check that if you're looking to expand your filers and and also one more thing is that uh i don't know for 18 but for OpenStack uh, 17, you can run mixed computes. So you can keep some, co you can keep your computes on RHEL 8 and you don't have to go to RHEL 9 all the way, uh, even if it provides additional benefits. And about the, uh, uh, the uh, Linux bridge uh, driver, uh, it's it actually a multiple step process because uh, it, it was introduced as early as Queens uh, as open flows and due to the collapse of the layers of networking you don't you no longer have uh, you know those bridges or sole purposes a whole sole purpose is to run IP tables then uh, it makes everything very fast and you don't have to go to OVN all the way you can take like an intermediary, intermediary step where you switch from Linux bridge to open flows. And then later on, maybe you'll, you'll be doing some OVN, but you, you don't have to, to do OVN at the same time you're migrating from Linux bridge to, uh, to open flows. But uh, that was super interesting. I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. Uh, the, you. you are doing great stuff for the science and uh, and um, uh, worldwide. You, know, you have re worldwide recognition of the qualities of this, the work you do out there. So thank you very much for saying that, sharing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey. You mentioned you wanted to use PGP on number in one of the slides. Um, or oh, that before we periodically find instability with in lag and um you know just uh i think i think it'd be fascinating to get away from layer two networking and, right. and get Most, to i can i can second that a lot of our bigger yeah. deployments are moving away from bx land evpn and to do yeah layer three just pure yeah. native just, layer, just three, pure right? layer so three i think with I mean, <laughs> once we wrap our heads around it, but, uh, you know, um, I would love to not have to worry about stuff like spanning tree anymore or, right. you know, um, my in lags flaking out and we, we lost a switch pair uh, last yeah. week. And what happens is, I mean, we have a pair of switches per rack. So if there's some isolation, but, um, you know, when the in leg freaks out, the switches stall and stop passing traffic, and then the NFS mounts get pulled out from under the running VMs, yeah. and it looks like uh, like a SCSI timeout, and then the file system goes read only, and we end up rebooting, you know, a hundred VMs. So, in 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 place of that, just run BGP between your copper rack switches in a kind of a classical spy and leap environment. Mm -hmm. And augment that with BMP and ECMP to uh, have link redundancy and fault tolerance. Don't get me wrong; I've never done it, but I've read about it. It's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> In my opinion, you know, it's it's easier than juggling a bunch of MLAG. Uh, yeah, just, I mean, it certainly has <clears throat> has given us plenty to, to work on and worry about over the years. All, all the all the layer two stuff. Yeah, I know some of our customers are still afraid of it. 
but yeah. those who have tried it have been very nappy. Well, oh, NASA may be afraid of it, so we yeah. may not get to do it, but um, you know, we would love to, to demo that new technology for them and, and maybe yeah. teach them something new. I can tell you a certain big customer in Spain is doing a lot of this stuff. So. And this is something I'm prototyping right now with OpenStack with free range routing, sitting on top of the compute nodes and, and mm -hmm. using multiple layer three links in favor of just using LACP on any kind of layer two link aggregations. And even if I never went to BGP and, and layer three based networking everywhere, I would love to be able to have Neutron directly controlling my switches so as to like dynamically do VLAN pruning based on the VMs that are right, because that would be super neat. You will have to go, uh, well, unless you do EVPN on the switches, uh, you'll have to go VXLAN for, to get VLANs to span across your racks. If, uh, yeah. Uh, I can have a, a short question. Um, do you support UEFI mode uh, for the VMs? Um, also, secondly, uh, are you supporting IPv6 addressing uh, into the VMs, or do you have any kind of such plans? Yes, we natively support IPv6 into end happily. Uh, and we even have some publicly available websites hosted in our cloud that are uh, IPv6. Uh, and the federal government loves that because of the IPv6 requirements that they put on all the documentation, even though no one actually really uses it. There's a certain other government agency that talked to me. They said, uh, can you do IPv6? And I said, yes. And they said, I hope the answer was no, because if you say yes, we have to say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we don't we don't fudge it or fake it or, or translate it to V4 or anything. We we support real IPv6 right down to the VMs. That's cool. Uh, and your other question was? Uh, UEFI boots for the VMs. I'm actually not sure. I'm actually um, not sure either. I, I think we're just doing classic BIOS, but I'm sure we could support it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's something I've, we've done a little bit. I know we are doing the, Q, Open the Q35. The Q35 uh, machine uh, type, types. which is, is nice because the virtual hardware shows up looking like a modern device, right? You recognize that acronym OVMF? And you probably aren't doing it with that. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>